Okay, we're on. All right. Mahalo for joining us. Have live and more with the Polar Council. It's afternoon already. Today we have Suzy Kanoglin for the Lanikula Multi Purpose Senior Center as our guest speaker. Uh, in the latter portion of our meeting, we will be uh, speaking with some advocates. But before I formally begin this meeting, which I may have already done, you hear it? I can't uh, understand what you're saying. With the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. So, if everyone will please stand. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Just gonna leave. Can't hear. Whatever you want to do. If I could, um, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to interject very quickly. It's very difficult to hear from the Zoom participants. If we could get the volume up, or bring them uh, closer. Closer to this, one of these is acting as microphone. So, okay. so as long as they, um, yeah, as long as you can hear, so, so, so they, could you please tell and see if they can hear Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Is it clear enough, or do I need to increase my volume? Oh, hello. <laughs> okay, okay it's thank coming you. Into this. Yeah, it's coming in through that. Okay, so great. The volume's on. Yes. <laughs> on Zoom to mute themselves until um, it's time for questions. And then at that point, if you will please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you would like to speak. So, mahalo. Let's see, is everyone muted? Okay. So again, I introduce former state legislator Suzanne Chan Oakland, who I had the pleasure of meeting back in 2014 or 15. Oh Thank you so much for your help with our proposed legislation. None of it went through, but we appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Um, she's here today as program director for the Lana Kima Multipurpose Senior Center. So it's your turn to speak, Susie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lila. Hi, everyone on Zoom and for everyone that is here today. Hi, Susie. Hi, Bob. Yeah, let's just do it on this one. I got an idea to make things better. Thank you. Um, for those that are on Zoom, I know you cannot see Doug, Helen, Epoch, Midge, Sherry, Lila, and you can see Barb. So I just wanted to let you know that there are others that are joining us in person. Um, I served at, in the legislature, first in the House for six years, and then 20 years in the Senate and had the pleasure of knowing all of you. So thank you for our joint advocacy on many important issues. I appreciate it very much. I'll just push this over. Rick, did you want to um, ask questions or do you want me to just go free, free for all? And <laughs> it really was a time for, I think people to talk starry. And if you folks had anything in particular you wanted to know, otherwise I can go through um, a few things that Rick had asked me about. Well, you know, Susie, you, you do so many things. Maybe you kind of just for folks that are here, although I have a feeling everybody knows you, could you just do an overview of everything that you're currently doing? I know you're on 50 boards at one time, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, just a little bit of an overview of what you are doing right now, especially at Lanakila. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, I'm the program director of Lanakila Multipurpose Senior Center. Lana Kila was created by the state of Hawaii in 1969 as a part of the Older Americans Act. I need to say, then and I can move it. And maybe folks can mute, please. I don't think they know how to mute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. So the state of Hawaii had created the Executive Office on Aging, which still exists, the four county area offices on aging, um, and they created Lana Kila Senior Center as an active program that really um, promotes and supports the independent and well-being of all of our kupuna. Um, Those were all done at the same time? 
Yeah, almost. Okay. It was in 1960, the early 1960s that the Older Americans Act was created. And thereafter, I think um, the legislature at the time, and I don't know who governor was at the time. Was it John Burns? Yeah, in the, 1969. So there were people like Akira Sakima, Peter Iha, those were legislators in our area. Um, and then there were many community leaders, including, um, I'm, I don't know his name, but he was it Caminos or something. Um, he and a number of community folks saw the importance of active aging and senior centers. So until today, it is still a state facility. It is under the Department of Accounting and General Services to maintain the large costs involved, if any. Um, but in 1969, Honolulu Community College was the operator of the senior center. And 1981, there was a new provost, maybe. I don't think it was a chancellor, but provost who said Lanakila or senior centers were no longer in the mission of community colleges. So the state asked the sitting county if they would want to run it. They said they didn't, they were not able to. And they asked the, um, I don't know who else, but Catholic Social Ministry, which now is Catholic Charities Hawaii. In 1981, they asked Catholic Social Ministry to operate it. And they have been operating it since 1981 until present, uh, the present day. So, so that's why yours is a little different than the others. Yes. Okay. It is. Um, you know, there are other senior centers. There's Waikiki Community Center, which has senior programming. Uh, we have Kapogulu Center, which um, and Mo'ilili Community Center that has senior programs. We have Nakapuna Makamai in Kaka'ako, and we have a lot of city senior programs. So our city parks basically has senior programs throughout the island of Oahu. Um, Lanakila was created so that people would remain independent and engaged socially, recreationally, was able to give back service to the community. And to today, that mission is still uh, alive and well. We have over 2,000 members and give or take, right? People pass or move away. Um, but very rarely do people go into nursing care facilities. You know, they're independent until the day they pass. Um, and that's the beauty of the senior center. Recently, Jack Lewin, who is uh, appointed by Governor Green to head up SHIPTA, which is the State Health Insurance Planning and Development Agency, SHIPTA, um, was invited by Carol Fukunaga, Senator Fukunaga, to look at Lanakila. And he was very enthusiastic um, being there and seeing what was being done. So he then asked the subcommittee, Kupuna subcommittee, um, who are all tasked to look at the health system of Hawaii and see if we need to revamp it in any way. Um, they are very interested in actually pursuing the original intent of the senior center, uh, which was called Hawaii State Senior Center when it was under HCC's purview. Um, the mission was to have senior centers throughout the state of Hawaii. So I think they see the value of that, uh, of the senior center. They realize just from a cost point of view, yeah, it's about $425,000 to operate every year that is equal to two nursing home patients. So you can see that investment and the prevention part of it and just having people continue to be independent uh, is really priceless to me. Um, so I'm hoping that there will be more energy towards expanding the senior center model throughout the state of Hawaii. Um, right now, if I brought these newsletters for those that are in person, but you can also find this newsletter online through www.catholiccharitieshawaii.org. 
um, and Hawaii is spelled out. And if you look at the newsletter itself, on the second to the last page and the third to the last page, uh, seven years ago, I think we had 32 classes a week, which is quite substantial. Um, we had 1,400 1, members and nine special events. As we, uh, these past seven years, as we expanded, we went from 32 classes to 40 classes. And then when the pandemic hit, we had to shut our doors and think in a different way. So we had, um, at that time, I think there were maybe seven classes that knew how to use Zoom. We taught about 600 people how to use their technology while our doors were closed. We partnered with Lanakila Pacific and taught nine people with one instructor during the pandemic because there was only 10 people 10 feet apart that could be right together. So we did three classes a day on a Monday and a Tuesday. And during that year or so, we were able to teach uh, quite a few people how to use their cell phones and their computers. Um, when we opened up again, we wanted to keep the online programming. And believe it or not, the Zoom programs that we had, we had zero online classes and workshops went to 300 the first year during the pandemic and then 600 the following year. So, you know, just by communicating with people, inviting them online to do a presentation of some sort, um, we really expanded the number of experiences that our members could have. And from nine special events, I haven't counted, but it's in the hundreds of special events now. Um, the pandemic was pretty interesting that it launched us, or at least for me, uh, when I got to Lanakila, no one was collecting any email addresses. And they felt that it was, you know, okay, because everyone that attended, they didn't have to have email. They would talk story with each other, call one another, see each other at the center. When the pandemic hit, and we could not communicate. We didn't have enough money to keep mailing things out. Luckily, we had a conference call capability with uh, my senior center program that we had instituted. So when we closed our doors on, what was it? Was it March, March 17 or something? Yeah. <laughs> I immediately sent a robocall to our 1,400 members and said, I'm sorry, our doors are closed, but we will be having different programs. And if you have an email address, please email us immediately. So we got 300 emails at the time, which is pretty good. Um, now we have close to a thousand emails, which means about a thousand members still don't have email addresses. And so we've been able to, in this post pandemic uh, situation, to have online programming, be able to communicate with about a thousand people via email, but we still have everything old style where you sign up on paper to give an equal chance to members who may not have technology and wanna participate in something. So when you come in our door, you'll see a binder. Now it's February through December of different activities that people can sign up for. Um, but it just taught us a different way. The older members, maybe in their 70s, 80s, 90s, hundreds, their preference is still to have some kind of social interaction through cultural clubs. All of our cultural clubs are at least 53, 54 years old. We are 55 years old this year. So that means Japanese club, Okinawan club, um, I think Korean club, maybe Portuguese and Hawaiian clubs, they started the same time. So they will be 55 very soon. Um, and Filipino club came soon after that, I believe. So there's a lot of elders that do want to socialize in that way, but we have a lot of younger seniors, 60 years and older, memberships free. 
um, that want to do classes, uh, workshops, and then go holo holo elsewhere. Um, so we are we have generational seniors that you know we are trying to address the interests that they have. So now we have over six classes a week, so it's double from seven years ago. I wanted more male programming because I noticed a lot of the programs were female pretty much. Um, so we do have pickleball, ping pong, uh, a lot more ukulele and guitar classes, um, cribbage, uh, other things. And so that has really, I see a lot more guys. And I know that when our EOA got a person came for a speaking engagement, Caroline Cadiral and Elderly Affairs, um, Derek didn't say this, it was Caroline. She said, wow, you folks have a lot of men here, which is unusual. I think for most senior programs, the females are very, um, what do you call it, active. So we're trying to get a lot more guys involved because we know when you're socially engaged um, and active, you live really long and healthy lives. So, yes, Lina. Okay, so and you said membership is free. Yes. So what about the cost of the classes? Is it also free? So classes, um, it's a, we cannot charge a fee. Mm -hmm. That is a part of our state and county contracts. Mm -hmm we suggest a donation. So the donation was $7 for 10 weeks of classes. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to take Tai Chi, it was $7. Recently with the cost of everything going up, the utilities particularly, um, you know, we did increase it. So for early registration, it's $9 mm -hmm. for 10 weeks. Um, we still have a lot of workshops and um, I guess like we're having different strength and balance things and computer things. We still don't charge anything for that at all. Well, we don't charge. We don't even ask for donation for those things. But for most classes, it is now $9 for early registration. Regular registration is $10. So it's like a dollar per class. A lot of folks, they just wanna hang out and talk story or they wanna go on the excursions or they want to come to one of the concerts. So the only cost involved is if you want to have lunch. So you pay on your own. What I will order lunches if they're in the senior center and then people just pay the cost. Actually, things have gone up on the restaurants side. So I was charging the regular price, so we're losing money right now. But that is how we've been able to expand to almost 4,000 activities this past year with no budget increase. And yeah. if someone doesn't live near Lana Kima, mm -hmm. let's say they're in a Kapahulu neighborhood, yeah. can they still attend Lana Kima or are they limited to Kapahulu? So historically, um, Lana Kima was to service Ward Avenue to Fort Shafter, from the mountain to the ocean. Um, since I've been there, we have not limited anyone to becoming a member. The main thing is they check out their own senior program in their community first. Oftentimes they will find maybe not the things that are being offered at Lanakila. So the only thing is you are 60 years old or older. You visit the senior center at least two times. So you feel comfortable being a member. And then you make an appointment with Iris Hiramoto who is our membership specialist. Um, and then you fill out an application form and then you become a member and have access to everything. Mm -hmm. And then you were talking about maybe expanding senior centers. Do you know if there's any legislation at this time? I don't quite no. know the problem. No, I don't think there's legislation. Um, I believe that SHIPTA is, I hope, going to be recommending as a part of their look at the entire health system mm -hmm. that senior centers be supported throughout the state. I do know that, um, yeah, there still has to be discussion about that cost. Uh, right now, the nonprofits primarily in city and the other three counties are providing senior programming. But if the state wants to take that step, 
to assure that maybe in new developments, you know, there's a senior center somehow connected, or uh, in planned communities, there are, is a senior center always available. You know, that that is a policy decision that still needs to be made. And there's one more question I remember someone asking: Is there a, a religious uh, affiliation? Affiliation? No, um, Catholic charities uh, actually employees are not necessarily Catholic. We have all different faiths that are working for Catholic Charities Hawaii, and definitely the programming is for everyone. There is no faith-based requirement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you don't do any faith-based thing. Um, we do no. I, I know the events that AARP participates in. We someone does a bless. Yes, a we usually a, say a, a grace or church. something. Um, yeah, a lot of our members want that. Yeah. And for our memorial service, because we have an annual memorial service to honor everyone that has passed, mm -hmm. it's always the third Thursday in May. We alternate Christian and Buddhist faith every year. So this year it'll be a Christian um, pastor, reverend, someone speaking. But we always have the programming permits every faith to be able to honor in their own way. We have, um, it's pretty cool how things were set up long before I got there. You know, there was a lot of thought in which day third? Wednesday, Thursday? Third Thursday in May. So this year it's May 23rd mm -hmm. from nine to 10. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Do we have anybody on Zoom with questions or comments? Well, Susie, you also you talked about a volunteer program that you have as well. Have you shared anything about that just yet? Oh, not yet. Um, so when we got uh, when I got to Lanakila, um, I think there were two hundred and eighty five volunteers. You know, every one of our classes, people are volunteering their time, some for decades. They are teachers, assistant instructors, facilitators. Um, we have people that are doing almost anything you can imagine, uh, whether it's upgrading our facility by painting projects or doing raised gardens. So we have fresh fruits and vegetables at our center. Um, you know, to basically, we have a lot of different events. So setting up, cleaning up. We have the Savers uh, fundraiser where we collect donations and then donate it to Savers, make money from that. We have four show and tell, um, show and sells, which are our way of uh, generating money for the clubs and classes so they can order food for a special event or buy supplies for their calligraphy class or what have you. Um, but if, if you look at people around here like Midge, and Ipo, um, do you want to say what you do as a volunteer? Because we have now over 700 volunteers. This past seven years, we've grown. And that's how we've been able to expand. You know, all the things that we do, even this particular occasion, you folks are all volunteers. Um, that really has been the, the heart of the center. People are but Mitch, Mitch, why don't you tell some of the people on Zoom what you do as a volunteer? Ooh. <laughs> one year. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am Mitch. I know I I like the uh, Memorial Day, uh, Grandparents Day, um, Children's Day, Day, and Veterans Day. So I do all those. So she she decorates the tables. She makes. Uh, helps with the floral arrangements for memorial service, our memorial program. For the veterans, she makes a display to honor our veterans. We have uh, 183 members currently. I don't know it changes. You know, there's always new members now and some of our other members pass. So 183 is what I know as of today. Yeah. Um, so Rick, to answer your question, basically, you know, as people say, Susie, do you need help? Or Susie, do you want me to do a water the plants? Definitely what I do is I talk with the person that's interested in volunteering and 
basically create a volunteer opportunity for them or for a group. Like we have church groups, we have Rotary, we have Kiwa um Key Club. Oh, sorry, not Key Club. Kiwanis, Lions Club, um, JCs, etc. They come and they say, Susie, um, you know, we're thinking of doing this or that. Or Susie, what do you need help with? Um, for example, the Elks Club, Kelvin Hara, he said, Susie, you know, this year we would like to help Mauna Kila. What do you need help with? Well, they bought poke for our Valentine's Day and they're doing a veterans program for our veteran members uh, in a few weeks. Um, the Ro Rotary West Honolulu, Naomi Masuno, she said she was at Honolulu Airport on her way to a service project in another country. She said, Susie, AARP just posted a grant. Do you need money? I said, sure. <laughs> um, but she said, well, okay, I'm going to type the grant now. And she was doing it literally at Honolulu International Airport and submitted it before she boarded the airplane. Oh I mean, you talk about that kind of commitment. Oh. We did not get the AARP grant national, but Jackie Bolin was asked, um, you know, can you folks help Mauna Kila with raised vegetable gardens? So they donated 2,500 and West Rotary West Honolulu donated another thousand. And that is how we did nine raised gardens and we have fresh vegetables that we serve on special occasions now, you know. So I Greg, see anyway. Greg. Yes. Greg's got it. Oh, sure, and, Greg. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering. Let me lower my hand. Just wondering about the volunteer. Well, I shouldn't say volunteers yet until you answer the question. The people that are leading your classes. Uh, you mentioned, you know, guitar classes, things like that. Are they paid or are they volunteers or they're, maybe all, it's volu they're all volunteers? Okay, that's amazing. So, so the next we have about a hundred um, instructors and assistant instructors. There's only one person that before I came um, must be there was a relationship with Kahala Nui. So till this day, they give one instructor, a fusion instructor, a stipend. But other than that, it is our uh, senior center members and people from the community that have different talents um, and they have been volunteering. That is outstanding. And, and I would ask, are they just volunteering or do you do any kind of a uh, annual reach out to try to get more people to help with the classes? Uh, they just volunteer. A lot of them I know from past lives um since I was a little girl actually some of them but you know they know what I'm doing and I think they really support our seniors but there are many senior center members if you can think of any career field we have them at the senior center you think about 2,000 individuals that are members they are architects, engineers, educators, librarians, social workers, counselors, owners of businesses. Um, they know how to build boats and cars, and they know how to, in their spare time, teach all these wonderful crafts and arts and dance and instruments, languages. Um, what we do on a regular basis after a 10-week session so we are currently in our winter session. We'll be starting our spring session of 10 weeks, April, then summer and fall. Um, we have a two week break, but before they break, we ask them every ninth week, how was your class? Because I we want to be evaluated constantly. And what would you like to see? And I read every single survey or, um, evaluation form and I see what people are suggesting so then I go ahead and call people either that I know or if I don't know like I'm still looking for someone that knows how to play go which used to be a Japanese man's game no females I'm still trying to look for a a teacher for that so if anyone knows a goal instructor I even my father suggested calling the association the Go association but that gentleman is too busy. So that is one of the few things that I have not found yet. Uh, for everything else, even like American Sign Language, one of the members 
Um, she was a former Department of Health worker. We have a lot of government workers, county, state, and federal government employees, uh, retirees now. But she had wanted an American Sign Language class for, well, I don't know how many decades. <laughs> Um, and lucky I, in my other career, I had started a deaf and blind task force. So I just called and I asked Eleanor McDonald. I said, Ellie, Ellie, do you know anyone that can teach American Sign Language? So she suggested a lady, Cheryl, who I knew, uh, Mizu Sawa, now she's married, but she teaches and she's been teaching for now almost four years straight, American Sign Language. Um, so really it is, you know, multiple, Greg, uh, many different sources, but you look at your own talent pool within your clientele, um, as Lanakila does, and you'll find just gems of people that have a lot of knowledge and skills. Mm -hmm. Excellent to hear all of that. Thank you. I have a, I have a question. Nobody had to see me. Um, no, I'm going to put no. it anyway. <laughs> okay, okay, you can see me. Um, let's see, I I work for Hawaii Meals on Wheels, and that's a volunteer organization. And I think I know you, you were on the board of Volunteer Legal Services Hawaii when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, so you know a lot about volunteers and volunteering. What compels, what do you do to get people to volunteer? And I think I direct this question to you and also to the people here who are also volunteers. For me, I think people know that I appreciate personally um, their service. And I think the members of the center also express that to many people. Um, it, the being appreciated is very important and actually, getting to know the person as a volunteer and what they are interested in, because that's my question to them. I know you want to volunteer, but what do you enjoy? And then after listening to that, you think about, okay, how can that talent or interest be utilized by the center? That's why I kept mentioning creating volunteer opportunities. It really is valuing and knowing what people are interested in. And I think also besides the feeling of appreciation is also um, they realize that they have a lot of talent that they can share and people are always wanting to help. So it's getting to know them, creating those opportunities and really valuing them either on a personal level. Um, we do have an annual volunteer appreciation day and that is always the third Wednesday in April. So it'll be April 17. So now there's a dilemma, right? We had 285 volunteers seven years ago. It's started to grow. We have over 700 volunteers now. So space is premium. And right now for every group that's volunteering, I can only invite one or two people because the number of um, members that are volunteering is at least for 400 um, and our center, although big, is not that big. <laughs> so um, that's a, another dilemma for us with regard to Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, we have a lot of different community partners. In the case of Thanksgiving, um, it was the Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union. Sylvia Young is a friend of mine. I knew her since um, neighborhood board day. She was with Nuuanu. And she said, Susie, how can I help? And I said, well, I think it would be nice to have Thanksgiving every year instead of sporadically, depending on if someone could fund it. So she goes, okay, I'll talk to the CEO and see if they can sponsor it this year. And I guess from the amount of thank yous and the joy that it brought, I think the CEO saw that. Uh, and the people at the credit union. So they said, we'll sponsor a second year, then a third year. It's been what, <laughs> six years now. Um, and the other thing was the food is so ono. Oh, Kahai Street Kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, also a friend of mine from high school. He's the owner. Oh, really? And um, they tried the Thanksgiving lunch because he could accommodate the people with, that we had. And they said, never change. <laughs> so... We, we continue to have Kai Street Kitchen, although we do have a lot of 
vendors. During the pandemic, you know, we created something called, um, it was dinner together. We only could meet by Zoom, but I did a drive-through. So that's how we've patronized all the small business, the restaurant owners. We'd order 50, 100 bento. I'd get that order, place it, pick up the meals, go right in front of the senior center and pass it out because we couldn't have anyone go in. Um, so till today, that kind of practice is still continuing. We don't have as many dinners together now because it's open again. We have a lot of lunches, <laughs> uh, sometimes almost daily. And so my staff is like, you got to... Because it is a lot of work. The amount of detail work that is done for each activity is quite a bit. And we have to capture all of that data for our contracts with the state and the city. Um, lucky Diane Torado, who's my boss at Catholic Charities, she's the head of community and senior services. When they asked me to work for Lanikila, she said, Susie, as your first task, can you please um somehow electronically a way to capture the data. So research was done. We selected my senior center, which is a touch screen. And every member and every guest can just log in every day. There's the list of what's happening on the day, all the different classes, the special events. You just click on that. And then Reva, poor thing, before, she had to transfer on from paper to the computer every activity of the day. Now, if everyone's diligent about touch screen, um, that is populated automatically. And that is how we were able to expand too. They do this on their own so, computer, iPads, or how does that work? So it is this kind of laptop. We do have a monitor um, and it says, Everyone was issued a barcode, like CVS, a little card. Yeah. And you just go to the um, reader. It'll populate it with that person's name. And then they just have to verify this is where they're going to go and finish. And they'll say, thank you, Doug. Well, the computer well, will say that. That's great. On, on screen. It's like the self-checkout. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, we wore it out after seven years, and so we had to replace it recently, and it took two months to do that. That was horrible for Reba. Yes, but finally we got it working again. Mm -hmm. well, that's just for a lot of people, um, because of income or asset income, uh, limitations or yes. tax, they are ineligible for 30 years of nonprofits, yeah. government agencies. Mm -hmm. What about Multi are they eligible regardless of the assets? Yes. yes. Um, the senior center was created with the thought in mind, and that's why till today we do not have a membership fee. It is so that that financial barrier is not a barrier. Um, for those that really want to take classes and they are not able to afford a donation, now $10 per class, um, they can talk to our social workers. We have two social workers, one on Monday and one on Wednesday. They are with our Catholic Charities Case Management Program, and we will find funds to help them. Most people are able to afford it, um, even those that are under the poverty level. But for those that are really having hardship, uh, that should not be a barrier. We can excuse them from that donation. Um, but we have a lot of opportunities that don't cost anything. So it's been, I think, very helpful for many people. I would ask Midge and Ipo, have you folks heard from members, you know, about any costs or thoughts about that answer on this question? When we attend a class, a second class, yeah, there's a cost, but we're willing to pay to learn. Mm. And that's the model of a lot of kilo. We pay, we learn, we serve. So. <laughs> <laughs> no place we can. <laughs> yeah, I understand that with nonprofits or private yeah. organizations that uh, they're generous and accommodate people with limited incomes or assets, mm -hmm. but some people who have a lot of income or a lot of assets, mm -hmm. are they still? Uh, a lot of oh yes, very much so. Um, so we 
if you have a breakdown, I think it's maybe 30% that are a, a lower income, vast majority is middle income, and we have those that are higher income. We do not discriminate in that way. If there was somehow a waiting list, then we would, by contract, need to look at those that are not able to afford um, because there may be less options for them, but we have not created a wait list. Um, I do know that our parking capacity is at its limit already. Um, we are looking at possibly building a new facility. We actually had gotten 6.8 million about five, almost six years ago, but then the pandemic hit and we were not able to expend. So the only monies we were able to save was the plan and design monies. Um, and we do need to have Executive Office on Aging agree to be the lead agency. Dads would still maintain it, but they needed that commitment from EOA. And I don't think that has been received yet. So we are kind of in a limbo approval, approval for um, to be the lead agency. E EOA hasn't, I think, signed a document, although I did talk to Caroline Kadiral, so she will look at what, why maybe that's not happening yet. Can I bring that up at a meeting? Uh, at their uh, meeting? Rick and I are both on Pavia. Oh, sure. You can ask. I, okay. I did want to give the benefit of the doubt, but it's been about maybe a year or so. Okay. Well, I wouldn't say if Susie said that. <laughs> but I, 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 I mean, I say that you talked to us and that that was something that was a possibility. Yeah. How's that looking? And see what you want. Sure. Okay. That Thank would you. be wonderful. Got that, Rick? I got, got it. it. All right. You'll bring it up, Barbara. Okay. Gary, Thanks. Gary can help out too. Yeah, I, I had a real quick question. If, so your community really is a community and, and people are really tight with each other. So as folks age and they hit like a bump in the road and they're at home, is there any outreach or any anything that you guys do or is that through Catholic Community Service or? Yes, um, we actually during the whole pandemic, we called yeah. the 1,400 people and growing uh, four year, I'm sorry, four times the first year, and I think three times the second year. Um, we still have the ability and have been calling members, especially if we haven't seen them for a while, to okay. make sure they're okay. Um, and of course, our members, you know, they are close with people. Um, and so if they notice someone is not coming, they will take that initiative on their own as well as let us know. Um, Currently, because so many people are active, they don't want to get that many calls because this Lady Pearl Lee and at one point it was Tawny Connolly used to call every month and uh, get through that list of members and they said, oh, I'm right here at the center. You don't have to call. <laughs> but they start to get a lot of that. So we kind of toned down on the telephone reassurance. Right. Um, but yes, for some people, uh, if they are a caregiver or they are still in isolation uh, by choice, oftentimes they, they are still concerned about the pandemic, believe it or not, some people. Yeah. Um, so we will contact them. And because we have some online programming, they can participate in that way. Um, and they don't want it to stop. Even right. though the pandemic is over, a lot of people like the convenience. They like the fact that they don't have to put on makeup uh, mm -hmm. and be able to participate and don't have to dress up. So we hear from a lot of folks why they would love to still have online classes, even though it does take up a lot. But what's amazing with um, online capacity is we could have speakers from all over the nation and all over the world. Right. So till today, we still have someone from South Korea. She, um, Our members really wanted to learn Korean culture and conversational Korean because they love their Korean soap operas. Some of them travel. And so uh, this lady, Jung Suk Kim, who is a teacher, I'm sorry, student of one of the members of the senior center, he was a professor uh, at one of the South Korean universities. He recommended her and till today, uh, once a month, she prepares curriculum online 
and we have an interaction with her on all different topics. That's um, amazing. Yes. Yeah. And then we had um, someone from, I don't even know where, Smoky, what is it called? Uh, Smoky something. It's somewhere in the mainland. <laughs> But we had a forest meditation. So she actually had the forest and the brook. You know, she'd show it online. And we had meditation that way. We had people from the big island, Maui, you know, talk about all different types of things. So, the, you know, in terms of expanding programming, it can be done that way. And uh, we had someone from New York who, who is a grandmaster, very well-known throughout the world for Tai Chi. And our member was able to um, give me his information. I didn't realize he actually charges like $700 for what he did for us. I just well, asked him, can, can you do this for our seniors? He said, sure. So he and his wife did a demonstration for an hour. Um, very generous. Very, very nice people all over. Don, hi, Don. Hi. So, uh, uh, several news reports had mentioned that uh, Catholic charities had something to do with placing the Gianna Bradley, the little 10 year old that got tortured and murdered. And I mm -hmm. wondered if you knew what part of the Catholic charities was doing that and, and why were they getting involved in placing children in foster homes? Um, Catholic Charities Hawaii has over 42 programs. We are just one of them, Lana Kila. Oh, I'm we not do, saying you did it. I'm just saying who, a, who's doing it? So I'm trying to explain there's different aspects. I am not familiar with what you're talking about. If it was something done by Catholic Charities nationally. No, it said that Hawaii, that okay. uh, Catholic Charities was part of helping getting her placed with the home that she was in. So people are pointing so have, out that we didn't pick her. These other places endorse these people. And, um, and it's I'm not familiar with what it is, but we do have an immigration um, program, and that is Sister Aurora, as well as Linda Spencer, who is on the Big Island. They have helped uh, immigrants as well as I guess refugees and more recently, some of the folks from different countries that there is war. But I think nationally Catholic Charities has helped different people. So um, something like a you murder have, you're involved in, you just don't know anything about it. If you don't know anything about it, yeah, I don't. I I, not I what you That something as serious as this and as well, you know, publicize it this that someone like you that's really in the know of things wouldn't have some knowledge, but I would hope that you would at least find out and tell them they should get out of doing things they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, maybe you can let me know the detail. I am not familiar with what you're talking about. You don't know we about the little girl a... that was tortured and, and, and killed uh, by her foster and then adoptive parents? It's just happened in the last two weeks. Mm, no, I don't. But that's all over the, the news department. Been, um, department of Human Services would be the lead state agency that would help with that. Um, right. But we do they're, the housing. Blaming, they're blaming Catholic charities as part of the problem. Oh, I'm not familiar. We have a housing assistance program. So it really depends. I'd need to have more detail to tell you if who may be involved with that from Catholic Charities. There's, again, 42. So all I'm asking is since you're involved in the Catholic Charities, if, if you could at least nose around and tell them they, sh they shouldn't be doing things if they don't know what they're doing. Um, I'm, I'm just somebody that reads the newspaper. <laughs> I wouldn't say they don't know what they're doing. I have to find out details before I would make that statement. There's a lot of things that may be just like the legislature where people in the public may know certain things, but the people that are actually involved may know other things 
that cannot be said publicly. So I'd have to find out, and I don't know if I'm in a position to even know the details, um, but you can call me, I guess, or text me the information or email me whatever you're referring to, and then I can ask the CEO. That's fair enough. Helen, you had a question or you wanted to say something? No. Uh, my name is Helen Quagner, and my first Dominion association with uh, Senator Chanukin was with UK, mm. um, but also along the way in advocating for grandparents raising grandchildren and the rights and bad things that go on. I, I thank you so much for having the ears to listen to little people because it took a lot of courage for her to bring up something. But uh, my association was that she does care and she does look into these things. She reads the bills when she, she was when she was serving the state. But a lot of us get sidetracked. We have to remember Catholic Charities helps and supports a lot of the community in a lot of different ways. But the newspapers can pick one little thing and throw the direction off of the real cause. But it brought an awareness that these things, like you presented to her because of your courage, will be looked into because if nobody says anything, and it just isn't her, it's your legislators, your departments. This is an election year. So use it to voice your questions. And they do look into it. And if they don't, keep asking. Because this is your state, your home, your families. And we all point out, oh, what can we do? And that's what I did as I watched her. And she gave to the community with love. And she took one day at a time and one step at a time. But she had the willingness to do what she could. And that's why we're all here. Because I thought I was giving my time. But the rewards that you give and you get when you're giving to your community instead of depression, instead of isolation, instead of aches and pains, walk with a purpose. And these are concerned people. Thank you and respect you because I try to use you and others that have love. And that's what you represent. Thank you for your all. Thank you, Helen. Thank so you, Helen. Don, later on, you can let me know a little more detail. I work 20 hour a day, seven days a week on Lanikila. We have 4.6 staff members. I don't know if you know that to do the thousands of activities that we do. So I'm sorry if I've not kept up with that particular issue, but I'm happy to find out more information. Thank you, Susie. Thank, thank you. Uh, I didn't mean to, I, I think everything you're doing is fabulous. Um, and I'm amazed, but I that's why I'm so shocked because I, I've known a lot about Catholic Charities. I was so shocked when it was in the newspaper and all the news services that that you were getting blamed, not you, but the Catholic Charities was getting kind of blamed for having something to do with it. And, um, and, and, and it's just dangerous in that respect alone uh, is that you're, you're giving the people that should be responsible, which is the, the, the group that place, you know, the state agency that they get paid to place people, if they get to start blaming charities, it's going to be a big mess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Susie, thank you so much for all the time you spent with us. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking that the Helen gave a wonderful summary mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. your your contribution to our community. Mm -hmm. You know, you did great. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else who would like to address um, I keep on thinking Senator Chan Oakland, I'm sorry. Cindy Chan Oakland. I did want to say thank you because I see everyone here and on Zoom. Um, and I know what kind of commitment you have to our community. So thank you very much.
and let me know if I can be of any service to all of you. Thank you very Thank much. You. So in, in this last segment, um, I'd like to give advocates an opportunity to talk to us and update us as to the programs, um, and, excuse me, the proposals they're pursuing at the legislature. Um, I see Nicole, thank you for joining us, Nicole. You were with us a few meetings ago, general meetings ago. Would you like to update us on your measures, your proposals, or not yours, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I came to you this summer to talk about paid family and medical leave. And uh, the good news is that the Kupuna Caucus uh, voted it as their number one priority for the Kupuna Caucus legislative package this session. I know a lot of you in this room that I see your faces um, were part of uh, convincing the Kupuna Caucus that this is very important. Um, just a quick summary, paid family and medical leave allows people to take time off from work and get some pay when they have to care for their family members who are seriously ill or even for themselves if they're seriously ill. So we mostly think of it as new babies, right? I'm from a children's organization and that's, most people think it's women and children, but it's also Kupuna care, which is why it's so great to ha also have the Kupuna caucus paying attention to these bills. Um, because I'm in the sandwich generation, um, you know, so many of my friends are raising children and also caring for their aging parents at the same time. And, um, you know, if you can't get some pay when you're taking the time off, um, then your fa these families are going into debt, falling into poverty, stuff like that, because, when, when, when a serious health issue arises, we have to take the time off. Um, so we're just trying to put a safety net in there. Um, there are two bills that are still alive. SB 2474 has a hearing on, well, it has a decision making for WAM at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. So that means you can submit testimony. Um, the deadline is tomorrow at 10 a.m. Or if you submit it later, it'll probably be stamped with a late stamp. Um, and then the way Senator De La Cruz does his decision makings, he, he doesn't allow any testimony. So you can send in like your written submission of testimony saying you support the bill, which helps, um, but there's no chance for talking at the hearing. Um, so that's Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, one thing that happened in the last hearing for SB 2474 is that the Department of Labor said that they are gonna need a ton of money to do this which is different from what we've been seeing in various analyses and studies that we've had done over the last few years. Uh, the design of this paid family and leave program is that we collect payroll deductions like social security or Medicare, and that those deductions pay for everything. It's gonna pay for Department of Labor to hire new people and to upgrade their computer systems. Um, and so in other states, they took a small loan at the beginning and then once the program was, the loan came from the state, and once the program was up and running, it all got paid back. Um, so that's one of my worries is that Department of Labor is saying it's gonna be super expensive, which might make it much harder to pass the bill. Um, and I can put a link into the chat um, with more information about that. The other paid family and medical leave bill is HB 2757, again, HB 2757, that has not been scheduled for a hearing and it needs to be heard this week. If it doesn't get a hearing, uh, it's gonna die. Um, it basically needs a hearing notice to be issued like today or tomorrow because we have to have 48 hours notice for these hearings. Um, Representative Yamashita uh, in kind of upcountry Maui is his district is the guy in charge of the finance committee. So if you can uh, take a moment to make a phone call or an email to Representative Yamashita to ask him to hear HB 2757, I'd appreciate it. And uh, we have a paid family leave coalition. Um, if you wanna get updates or become a member so that we have you listed on our website. Um, again, I'll put some links in the chat um, uh, and that way, you know, you can learn more about the bills as they go through session. Hopefully they'll make it to the second half. Okay. Thank you. Our committee on finance for decision making on our first agenda. 
First off, it's House Bill 2309. Thank you. Just listening to someone's legislative hearing. Um, <laughs> Greg, are you ready for us with our update? Uh, yes, and I apologize in advance. There's someone that just started doing some hammering or construction probably above me. Um, so if you hear some background noise, I apologize. Um, I'm just going to give, uh, hopefully it'll be brief, but it might be a little bit of detail, but a brief update on some of our condominium related measures for um, better consumer protections. So last year, the Kakua Council proposed four measures for better consumer protections for condominium owners, which were introduced as six bills. And this year for the 2024 legislative session, we proposed three more, which were introduced as six bills, SB 3204, SB 3205, SB 3206, and companion bills HB 2701, HB 2680, and HB 2681. All of these measures were drafted by either Lila Moore, the president of Kakua Council, or co-drafted by Lila and I with inputs from um, many others that we've spoken with. So just to give you a, a summary of um, the most important ones, SB 3204 and its companion bill, HB 2701, would strengthen the right of owners and others who have been retaliated against for raising concerns at their associations. And it would provide an, improve, uh, an improvement in the judicial path if a case were to be filed. So these unfortunately were not scheduled for committee hearings and I don't believe they're gonna be moving forward. I think it's too late. Uh, SB 3205, one of the most important measures would provide an ombudsman's office for condominium owners and associations to resolve disputes and address violations of governing documents and state laws within HRS 514B. Uh, that was heard by the Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee and unfortunately was deferred. So regarding that, I have just a comment. While it's a very simple common sense approach to address disputes and issues without costly mediations and litigation, also in other states, there are definitely hurdles that we need to overcome in Hawaii. The opposition, unfortunately, is stacked with attorneys who love their payday, collecting huge sums to write letters and sue condominium owners, including many kapuna. Uh, you know, we've got um, non-judicial foreclosures that used to be a thing, and now we've got judicial foreclosures that are happening more and more. And so we need that to have our legislators attention. Um, unfortunately, the attention that the legislators have right now is with their campaign donations. So we have some of these attorneys that are actually testifying against these common sense measures that would help you know, provide better consumer protections. They're actually donating very large campaign donations. And it's on the record and it's very concerning. And I've started to publicly kind of um, put a light on that. So then we've got SB 3206, uh, which is a similar measure to SB 3205. That That is actually not going forward. Um, it would be to encompass all of HOAs and planned community associations. HB 2607 would remove the standard condominium proxy form option to give a proxy to the board of directors as a whole or to directors present at the meeting. Uh, that would require also a disclosure statement on the standard condominium proxy form informing unit owners that an association may direct elections by electronic, machine, or mail-in voting. HB 2067 has survived two committee hearings and is moving forward as written. We ask the membership of Kakua Council to please follow this bill closely and testify in support of it if you agree with its intent. Uh, there's another similar measure, SB 2404, uh, one of those um, requests for removal of two options on the proxy form is moving forward. Unfortunately, one was left in second that actually weakens that bill. And then the last bill that I'm going to mention here is SB 2493, which would prohibit, prohibit condominium associations from assessing, demanding, or seeking 
reimbursement from a unit owner for the association's total and final legal fees in excess of 25% of the original debt amount sought by the association. That's a very important measure. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the attorneys who are you know, suing often uh, for various things. And that's a problem because they, they seem to have an, un, um, I guess the word I'm looking for is uh, there, there's no controls or limit set on what they can do. And they can basically sue you for a $2,000 debt and charge $25,000 to $40,000 in attorney's fees. And there's actually examples of that I have right now on the record that I'm starting to bring forward and shining a light on. Uh, and lastly, with the bills, we've had numerous neighborhood boards that are supporting these bills with resolutions, including the Waikiki Neighborhood Board, where I serve as the Subdistrict Two Vice Chair. I'll stop there, and I don't know, Lila, if you want me to add something on the bridge if there's more time, but I'm going to stop at that point, and you can add, add that later if there's more time. So I'll stop. Right. I think Dale's hand up. Go ahead, Dale. You're muted. Oh. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, very good. Real fast, though. 2018, I asked for uh, people in the uh, HOAs to get ballots, not proxies, and that was killed. And I asked for it again, it was just killed again. Five years has gone by, I'm back where I started. The problem is we have people on the take down at the Capitol, and the people that have figured out how to monetize Voter suppression are laughing all the way to the bank, laughing at us and uh, stupid people in the Capitol, they can only count the money that they receive from people outside of their own district. They get elected to represent a district, instead they represent corporate interests from outside their district. This really sucks, but that's all I gotta say, thank you. Thank you, Doug. You're up next. Yeah, quick question to uh, Suzanne Chan Oakman uh, because of yeah, yeah, nobody's going to see me. because of your uh, experience as a, as an elected official. There, there are different ways we're talking about ways of influencing uh, um, bills and how to get them to pass and that sort of thing. Now, there are different ways we can do that. We can call various people, write emails, submit. Uh, um, support and oppose uh, from the from the website, submit a letter, you know, from your organization, Planet Doug Worldwide or whatever it is, opposing or supporting it. In terms of effectiveness, what 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 is the most effective thing that we could do? The most effective, I think, for most legislators is getting to know them. <clears throat> so depending like this condominium set of bills, um, primarily it would be going through consumer protection related committees. Um, it, does it go to housing at all? Okay, she lost you there. Okay, so you, so you need to look at the makeup of the committee. You definitely should be talking now, well, during the interim from June through September, really having a meaningful conversation with the chairman, the vice chairman, and the members of the committee that is going to be the primary or lead committee. And be succinct, prepare well, um, and really maybe explain, well, hopefully these guys are familiar with a lot of the condominium problems. I know most people who are not condominium owners have no understanding. I'm one of them. I actually sat down with, even though I wasn't on CPC, um, probably about 50 condominium um, board officers and tried to understand the complexity of it. Um, it is very complex. And so... Yeah. Were, were you involved in that? It was in conference room 229 yeah, we for many. Before. Yeah, so we had a number of meetings and basically um, we tried to draft legislation, but it's important to find out from the chairs, ask them based on the concerns and be succinct of what those concerns are, what the challenges are. 
would they recommend any kind of change in statute? Because sure if they... It was the same problems that ADU. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I educated myself as one of 76 legislators, but it is important to talk to the chairs and vice chairs and the committee members that are going to be determining the fate of your bill. So it is important, one, during the interim, when there's more time, because Otherwise, the legislators are bombarded with thousands of people in a very short window. How about unofficial things like golf course conversations? Do those count for anything? Well, it depends who the chairs are. If I was the chair, I, I wouldn't be on the golf course. Well, <laughs> but if it's, you know, that you, sort of thing. You that. need to know the people. Um, similar to what I did when I first became a legislator, I actually scheduled appointments with 75 members. So I could get to know them personally and also to understand the interests of their districts. I think maybe five people didn't meet with me, but everyone else did. Wow. So it is important to take that time. <clears throat> um, if, who is the CPC chairs now? Who has no condominiums in his area? Yeah. Very few. Very few. Um, I don't see the CPC is. This is a test, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, so all I'm saying is know who they are, the subject matter committee, um, find out from the or you know, put together something very succinct, like in a one page or two page. I know that's very hard with condo issues, right. but what are the main concerns? And as a group of condominium folks, um, there has to be consensus because if people are mm. at odds with one another, legislators are, I think, would have a very difficult time trying to figure out who is correct in this. So they want to think, these people want this rather than well, they, they closer to that. Than it's to like, that's why I like to do this activity all the time. Um, what I would do is have a group of 10, a group of 100, a group of 1,000, put on a piece of paper their top priority, crumple it up, and then bombard each other. Because hmm. then you'll feel what the legislators got to go through every single day. Um, <clears throat> but basically... You need to communicate what is most important, and it may be one topic at a time. Mm -hmm. That's how the Kupuna Caucus, the Keiki Caucus, that's what we did. Um, we, we have a finite number of priorities, and you say, could you please help us? This is what we are thinking. This is the problem. But can you provide guidance to us as to how we may address it? A lot of things were not legislative legislatively connected. What I found is 70% of the things that were brought to my attention, we could solve in the community um, or without any legislation. Mm -hmm. It was Nakashima. So, so Mark doesn't, uh, but he, right. But also the history, right? Those people may have been on CPC for a while. So that's how you learn also. Right, there's been iterations of these issues. So do your homework, understand maybe the, the level of um, familiarity they have, understand that maybe their own community may not have the condominium um, issue at hand. But I think as people, they probably could understand the dilemma. If you have neighbors and you're at odds with one another, that makes for a very unhappy building. <clears throat> I don't know if you can bring it down to that level, but well, for it, our problems, and I think my colleague most of them on Zoom right now, the issues are not owner against me. It's owner against the board or against management. Right. So uh and you've heard this pretend, you know. So I know that there are different management companies that have different the managers themselves have different abilities either to facilitate well or not facilitate at all mm -hmm. and probably cause more dissension. Mm -hmm. So I know part of the conversation that I had back then, that was in the early 2000s, I think, that I met. 
um, was to have um, training, and I think it was developed by, was it Louise Iwaishida? It, there were, no, not, not, not. Oh, what is her name? Jane, Jane Sugimura. Sugimura. So they did a series of things to kind of train the board of directors. Um, so they knew what their responsibilities are. But um, I don't know how far that went. Because that was part of it. The board wasn't familiar with what their responsibilities were. Or that they can't do certain things. It's not ethical. Or, you know, they didn't even know like parliamentary procedures. But um but also the management company so Hawaiiana what I don't know all the different companies um at that level they do have a condo group I think Jane and someone else used to have regular training and we tried to work at that level with the management companies you know to have very pertinent, training opportunities for the managers of the condos so they could be better facilitators and really know the law. Could, could I could I interject from um over here I've had my hand up for a little while but I just don't want to miss an opportunity okay. to to respond to something Suzanne. Yes. Um first of all there's consensus within the the public the owners that have concerns um so that's clear. Second, regarding the legislators, they're, they're, they know who we are. We speak with them all the time. The problem is that the people who are providing the campaign donations are the people like a, an attorney. His name is Philip Nearney, and he's heading the task force, uh, one of the task forces that was enacted by Act 189, signed by the governor, uh, to look at condominium issues. And he sues condominium owners. Um, He's in opposition to the better consumer protection measures. He contributes to the senator's campaigns. Uh, it's on the record. This is a problem. Regarding Ms. Sugimura, unfortunately, she's an attorney who also is not uh, being helpful to condominium owners who opposes the very same measures Kakua Council is proposing and who frequently misrepresents and misinforms the public openly and you know, I, I'm calling it out in my testimony. It's very serious. It's it's so time we had conversation at Cocoa Council inviting Jane and Phil to the meetings to talk about it. Because that kind of conversation that you're even having with the legislators, I don't know the quality of that conversation and whether or not there has been an invitation for them to be a part of the the brainstorming of what the solution could be. Right. Well, this has been going on for years. I'm going to let Lila take take it from here, but this has been going on for years and years. And the last thing I wanted to interject. Been, there has been meetings with Phil and Jane or whoever you're viewing no. as. No, 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 no. If I could, Phil and Jane, unfortunately, they have a platform that we don't have. They have Think Tech Hawaii, Condo Insider, which is subsidized by Senator Morawaki and Jane Sugimura herself. I'm assuming I don't well, I don't want to assume, but maybe I know, I know them and okay. I have them. so they have a public forum that we don't have as a public forum. They're not inviting us as condominium owners. It's them. It's the parliamentarians who are problematic to this state. They're not licensed. They misinform. They misrepresent. They oppose the very same consumer protection measures that we're trying to get in place. I serve as a director on my condominium association here. I have a board meeting this evening. They're very contentious. I've been actually muted as the meeting started by the board president. So I couldn't even speak. That's a, a violation of HRS 514B-125. There's a statute, open meetings, board members need to be avail you know, open to speak. You can't mute. It's got to be an open informed meeting. So we do our meetings by Zoom. This is going on on a regular basis, but lastly, I'll say this to pass it over to Lila. We've got criminal activity here, corruption, um, fraud, misrepresentation, violations of a lot of statutes, excuse me, and very, very bad things happening. So these are the issues that we need the ombudsman for. These are the issues that we need our legislators for, not that there's condominium disputes between owners. 
I'm not stressed about those issues. I'm stressed on a daily basis about the other issues that are impacting the ability for owners to even own their property. They're being squeezed out with ridiculous assessments. I pay about $1,000 a month for no amenities. We have nothing, no swimming pool, nothing for a one bedroom. I'll pass it on to Lila. Since the tone, it's a very big deal. We need to address this. We need the legislators to help. Thank you for so that. So board members are no longer owners? I thought the board members were owners. I'm an owner and I'm a board member on the association's so, board of directors. So there is contentiousness if the board is, is not actually being respectful to other owners. We have a rogue board who's violating laws. So that's what I'm referring to when I say, yes. and it's not necessarily owner to owner that I'm concerned about. It's more people not knowing, first of all, the laws that are in place and not getting proper training. No, no it's um, not about the training. Also, the tra it's not about the training. You know, our board president is an attorney. He, he's, uh, uh, he, he, works for Corporation Council for the City and County of Honolulu. He knows what he's doing. Who Yet is he can, so I'm not going to name him here. I'm not, he's named in my testimony. I'm not going to name him here. He's named in my testimony. But he knows yeah. better. But as do these, for, yeah. as do these other board members. And I educate them every board meeting. I educate them through emails. You're violating a statute. You don't have any bids or proposals in our board packet, yet you just voted to bring in a contractor with no bids and proposals that I can look at. I educate them, Suzanne. I do. And, what, yeah, but and they go the other way. And the attorneys have you folks, I guess, if you're attorney's representing- in on it. Our attorney's if, in on it. Our attorney is in on it. He collects a big paycheck. They're suing an owner for $4,500, I think. And already it's over $20,000 in attorney's fees. It's public record. The the, uh, the case is being heard in April. The attorney's in on it. And they're frequently in on it at these associations. You know, uh, at this point, we're already past our one o'clock time. So I would like to wrap up this meeting. I think that we can carry on this conversation later. Mm -hmm. I think that would be more appropriate. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for everyone who participated. I'm sorry that we ran out of time. We had a late start. Sorry. Oh, it's not your fault. <laughs> yes, it is. We're still out the case of having a hybrid meeting. Right. We're still new to the process ourselves. So thank you very much for everyone who participated in today's meeting. And we'll carry on the conversation at a later point. Mahalo, is that sound open? Yes. Thank you, Susie and everyone. Thank you. Thank you.